Let's pray. Lord, we want to remember right now <clears throat> what things were like when you sent your son. It was a world in which people didn't trust the government. It was a world ravaged by disease. It was a world filled with racial tension and economic uncertainty. And that's when you said, I'm going to send my son right now. Lord, we are familiar with such brokenness. We think we're the first ones in history. And how gentle and kind you are to remind us that we are still broken. And how gentle and kind you are to send your son into brokenness such as ours. That he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Lord, we need you. We don't need you any less or more than they did in the first century. We just need you because we're humans and we're broken and we love other things more than you. We confess that we love other things more than you. And we confess that we need you. So may our hearts long for you as we hear your word taught now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're preaching through, let's get the lights on. Yeah, well, we're preaching through the book of Isaiah. It's written in the Old Testament. The Old Testament before the birth of Jesus. So when we look at the Old Testament today after Jesus, we kind of look at them with different lenses because the Old Testament is pointing uh, towards Jesus. And um, wow, kids need to be dismissed. I got totally uh, sidetracked there. I launched right in. So if the kids who are helping with the Christmas program, you can go. And if you're um, listening on video right now and you're a child and you want to practice, go ahead. That would be fine. <laughs> We're going through the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And uh, it's a tricky thing when you look at the Old Testament because it was written to Jewish people, God's people in the Old Testament, but things have changed now because of Jesus. So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like, all right? Now, we'll jump right in here. All of the Old Testament directly or indirectly points to Jesus. All of the Old Testament directly, such as Isaiah 53, the, the servant who will come and die for the sins of his people, the Lamb of God. It's directly pointing to Jesus. What Ben just read this morning, Isaiah 11, directly pointed to Jesus. But all of the Old Testament that doesn't directly point to Jesus, indirectly points to Jesus. Now, the tricky part about this is that sometimes pastors and preachers and teachers jump too quickly to Jesus, and they don't let the original idea sit long enough. All right? Now, where did I get this idea that all of the Old Testament points to Jesus? Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, there were a couple of guys who were walking away from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, which is just a couple of miles away. They were walking and they were discouraged. They had left everything to follow Jesus, only he had died, and they didn't know that he had raised from the dead yet. And suddenly, this guy shows up with them, and they don't recognize him as Jesus at first, and they're discouraged, and Jesus is like, why are you discouraged? And they're like, well, we, we met this guy who we thought was the Messiah, and he died. In fact, he was crucified. He was rejected by all the Jewish people who we think should have accepted the Messiah. And so, in Luke 24, it tells us this. Here's those disciples, and Jesus on the way. This isn't an actual picture for those of you who didn't know that. This is a recreation later. Just wanted to be clear there. I said, here's Jesus, but that's, uh, I think this is from a movie or something, right? They didn't have movie cameras back then, for those of you who aren't familiar with the first century in uh, Judea, okay? Um, Jesus, as he, they said, we're, we're discouraged of the Messiah. He, we thought he was a Messiah, but obviously he wasn't. And so Jesus goes through the Old Testament, and this is what Luke 24 says, beginning with Moses, in other words, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's Moses, and the prophets, that's the rest of the Old Testament, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures, by the way, scripture, they didn't have the New Testament yet, so he's looking at the Old Testament and showing them the things concerning himself, that all of the Old Testament, directly or indirectly, points to Jesus. Now, the danger is, uh, sometimes I, I've sat through sermons where a guy used the Old Testament and he immediately jumps to Jesus where it only indirectly points to Jesus. So we have to be careful about that. We need to figure out what's the original uh, audience, but then we need to read it a second time in some ways. And how does this point to Jesus? Otherwise, if we're not careful, the Old Testament's nothing but a bunch of rules and we don't see the grace in the Old Testament. And we don't see God drawing near. So we always need to now, after Jesus, look back at it with Christian lenses. So, 
You have the original audience when you're trying to understand and teach the Old Testament. And as we've been going through Isaiah, I've been trying to do that regularly. What did this mean to them 700 years before Jesus? But we can't leave it there because something happened in history. So we need to jump and we look in the Old Testament to, well, what's true about God always? So if we're not sure how to apply an Old Testament passage, what does this reveal us that's true about God always? Or what's true about humans throughout all time? Because Uh, 2,700 years ago, they wore different clothes than us, but here's what they were like. Are you ready? They were stubborn, and they were self-centered, and um, they loved other things more than God. That's the same. Humans don't change. I mean, we wear different clothes, but if you were to go to, like, Pakistan right now, do you know what you'd find out about people? They're stubborn, and they're self-centered, and they love, unfortunately, in Nebraska, we don't have that problem, but I know in other places of the world, I've heard it's true, all right? That was sarcasm for those of you who are not familiar. All right, so what's always true about humans? And then, well, how is this fulfilled in Jesus? Or how does this point to Jesus? So we're going to do a little bit of a case study real quick from Deuteronomy chapter 23. It's on the screen, all right? Deuteronomy 23 gives rules, Old Testament rules, for approaching God in worship in the temple. Now, of course, something's changed. We don't have a temple we don't literally slaughter bloods and, you know, bulls and goats and, and sheep anymore because something has changed. Well, the ultimate sacrifice has come. So how do we approach this text in the Old Testament? How does it apply to us today? Here's what the text says, Deuteronomy 23. It says, no Ammonite, which is a foreign tribe living right next to Israel. No Moabite, another foreign tribe living next to Israel. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly. They can't come in and worship in the temple. May, they may not enter the sin. Now, what's going on here? Now, the Ammonites and the Moabites, when, they were, when there was the exodus and the, God's people were coming from Egypt to the promised land, the Ammonites and the Moabites said, no, we're going to oppose you. You can't travel safely through our land. And we're going to oppose you. And God says, I'm going to remember that. Something's got to change for them to be able to enter into my prompt, my, um, to enter into worship me and enter into my presence. So, what does that mean for us today? Well, actions have consequences. That's true today, just as much as it was 3,000 years ago. God remembers. Actions have consequences, and they oppose God's kingdom, and opposing God's kingdom is tragic. There's this extra step for these people. They couldn't enter into God's presence. All right, now, tune in here. What does this teach us about God, okay? What does this teach us about God? Tune in, okay? God is holy. God is holy, and he demands holy worship, So not just any Gentile could come in back then. Not just any Gentile. You had to be cleansed. You had God is holy. He demands holy worship. Important point. Tune in, okay? All of life now is meant to be worship. Everything you do, everything is worship. And now what we're doing together this morning is we're coming together as a corporate people. We're worshiping corporately, all right? Here's the question for us today. Is God less holy today than he was 3,000 years ago when he wrote Deuteronomy 23? Serious question. Does God still demand holy worship today, 3,000 approximately 400 years later? That's a scary thing, right? Now think about how flippant we are. Now praise God, it's because we, well, we take it for granted, but something has changed. Something has changed. God demands holy worship. Now this is going to point us to Jesus. Think about it. This should point us straight to Jesus. There's a reason we didn't get hit with a lightning bolt this morning when we came together to corporately worship. There's a reason. God's just as holy as he was 3,400 years ago. And the reason is that all people, not just Gentiles, all people need a holy Savior if we were to worship a holy God. We came in here and there was so much grace upon your head you didn't even realize it because you weren't struck down. We came in here and we sang about Jesus and we prayed in Jesus' name. The only reason we're able to corporately gather before a holy God is because we now have a holy Savior. Praise God. That's beautiful. It, it's, it's somewhat terrifying. We need to be reminded regularly of how holy he is. But God's grace is so amazing that we can now enter his presence. And all people, not just the Gentiles, Ammonites, Moabites, they're, they're invited, they lay their burdens down, they lay their sin down, and they can come to God if they come to him through Jesus. So, Isaiah 56 and 57 is what we're going to go through today. And as I was thinking about, okay, so what, how do we make this, how do we talk about this right now? I decided to crack out the red sweater, and we're going to see how this applies to Christmas, okay? 
We're going to see how this applies to Christmas. How do these verses in Isaiah 56 and 57 directly point to Jesus? Some of them directly point to Jesus. Some of them indirectly, and we're going to try and trace that path. So we're going to look at what it meant to the original audience and their needs and their problems. Their needs and their problems weren't all that different than ours. But the application now, we fully see it through, coming through Jesus. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah 56 and verse 1. If you didn't bring a Bible, we'd love for you to read along. It's page 616 in those black Bibles in front of you. Go ahead and take one out and read if you didn't bring a Bible. If you know someone who needs a Bible, take it and give it to them. Or if you need one yourself, take it as our church's gift to you. Now, before we read here, let's talk a little bit about, about the original audience, the original idea here in these first two verses of Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. Now, here's the main point to the Jewish audience of Isaiah 56, verses 1 and 2. God calls his people to reflect his character. Now, that's actually true to us today as well, but, well, we'll jump to Christmas in just a moment. God calls his people to reflect his character, and thus we see these commands in Isaiah 56, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and he keeps his hand from doing any evil. Even the Sabbath would take us a while to talk about what that looks like for Christians. We're not going to right now. The main point right here is that God is calling his people to reflect his character. God is calling his people to reflect his character. Well, that actually points us to Christmas. Because God's people never reflect his character perfectly. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. We need a holy, perfect sacrifice. And the Messiah, the Messiah kept justice. He kept righteousness perfectly. We are called to do it. We can't, and yet a Messiah comes, and he keeps justice, and he keeps righteous perfectly. Over and over again, I have a couple passages there in Isaiah where it specifically says that the servant, the Messiah, is going to perfectly establish and keep justice and righteousness. Righteousness, you could think of it as the word holiness. Holiness. Now, in Luke 23, in Luke 23, Jesus has just died on the cross, and a centurion says something really important. The centurion says, surely this man was innocent. Now, what's he saying? He never broke justice or righteousness. He never sinned, right? And it's saying that about that, that Jesus perfectly kept the law. And then 2 Corinthians 5 says this about Jesus. He, God made him who knew no sin to be a sin offering for us that we might become, the word is righteousness, that we can become holy in God's sight, not because of our holiness or our religious efforts or our being nice or anything like that, but because Jesus was the sin offering and his holiness, his righteousness covers us. We need a Messiah. We need a Messiah to, to reflect God's character. And then the amazing thing is that the Messiah is going to send the Holy Spirit to help us to reflect that character as well. The Messiah gives the Holy Spirit to help believers act and love like Christ. We've read these prophecies before as we've gone through Isaiah about how the servant, the Messiah, is going to give the Holy Spirit. And Jesus talked about it a lot. In fact, John the Baptist, when he first saw Jesus, one of the things he says, is he says, I baptize with water, but that guy, he's going to baptize with the, the Holy Spirit because that's what we need to change our hearts. Listen to me closely. Some Christians make a really big deal out of the Ten Commandments as if we can still keep them today apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't. You can't keep the Ten Commandments apart from the Holy Spirit. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't. You need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit changes your heart into a heart of love and righteousness and justice like we've just talked about. And the beautiful part is when you trust in Jesus, you're no longer walking alone. God gives you the Holy Spirit to live inside you to start changing your heart into a heart that loves God, into a heart that loves neighbor, and love the, well, and the hardest neighbor of all to love, your spouse, I'm not even kidding. You need the Holy Spirit to have a healthy marriage and the Messiah is going to give it. All right. Now verses uh, three through eight. So the original audience, we're gonna go through these in just a moment. 
This is what these verses meant to the original people as Isaiah spoke them. All people, all people, including very unexpected ones, they're invited to dependent intimacy with God. All people, including very unexpected people, are invited to dependent intimacy with God. I don't know who the worst person you can think of is. God is inviting them to dependent intimacy. There's grace enough to save them if they will turn to him. In fact, we read earlier about the Moabites and the Ammonites. Well, just pay attention to what what God is doing here in Isaiah 56 and verse 3. Let not the foreigner, ooh, the Gentile, the Moabite, the Ammonite, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, well, the Lord's surely going to separate me from his people because I'm not one of those good Jewish guys over there. I'm just adding my own here. The Lord's surely going to separate from me. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord, who's followed the Lord, say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. There's this weird thing if you were to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 23. And, and God, um, God says in Deuteronomy 23 that any male who doesn't have whole functioning sexual organs, can, it literally says, I mean, it says it even more lewd than that if you want to go look yourself, uh, can't enter into the assembly. They're not clean before the living God. And yet look what he's inviting them. These eunuchs, interesting, very unexpected. Now keep going. Verse 4, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these will I bring to my holy mountain, that's intimacy, Zion, And I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Not just the Jewish peoples, notice that. For all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those he has already gathered. This is hinted at in the Christmas story, trying to keep you alive, trying to keep you awake here. Okay, this is hinted at in the Christmas story. Shortly after Jesus is born, his parents take him to the temple, take him to the temple to be dedicated, all right? And uh, at the temple, there is um, a godly old man called Simeon. And he goes, and and the, the Holy Spirit reveals to Simeon that this is the Messiah. And so he goes and he picks up this little baby Jesus and he speaks this prophecy and he says, this child will be a light to the Gentiles. You and I are sitting here today because of the hope of Christmas, because of the hope of Jesus, the light to the Gentiles. The light to the Gentiles. The Messiah is going to be, and he is, a light to the Gentiles. The Messiah is a light to the Gentiles. That's the reason we're sitting here today. We don't deserve to be in the holy presence of the living God, and yet how kind of God, how kind of God to come and and speak that message to all people's The light is here, and we come to the Father, intimacy with the Father through Jesus. I'm going to have a series of paintings throughout this sermon by one of my favorite artists. He's called Daniel Bunnell, Daniel Bunnell, and um, this is called The Shadow in the Middle, and it's a picture of, well, by the way, I I listened to an interview with this artist this week. He said, all of my paintings I view as a prayer to my Heavenly Father. I thought, that's so cool. Do you view BD as a prayer to your Heavenly Father? Oof, do you bear taking care? Do you, wiping a bottom is actually a prayer to your head. All of life is worship. But this painting is him, is Jesus uh, speaking grace over the adultery woman, the woman caught in adultery. See all the accusing shadows? That he's her light and he's protecting her from the darkness. I love that. The Messiah is a light to the Gentiles. And the Messiah, he prefers those who are humble and broken. Ammonites, Moabites, eunuchs, prostitutes, tax collectors, type of people Jesus hung out with. Those who were vain, those who were self-righteous, those who were proud, Jesus didn't have a lot of time for them. He prefers those who are humble and broken. He prefers those who are humble and broken. That scripture, Mark 2.17, Jesus says to the Pharisees, he says something really sarcastic and hard. He says, a physician 
Physician doesn't come to heal the healthy, but to the sick. I came not to call those who are righteous, but sinners. So those who are humble and broken by their sin, he's inviting them. He's inviting them. The Messiah prefers those who are humble and broken. We need to be marked by humility and brokenness as a people. That lets people know that God is alive. They're not impressed with our pride. They're not impressed with our good looks. They're not impressed with our money. They're impressed when we become whole through humility and brokenness and taking it to the, to the Messiah, Jesus. Now let's look at verses 4 and 5, just a moment. The Messiah offers specific healing for our brokenness and our shame. Verses 4 and 5, the Messiah offers specific healing for our brokenness and shame. I'll explain that one more time. The Messiah offers specific healing for our brokenness and shame. The, verses 4 and 5 are written to a eunuch. And in that day, in that society, a eunuch would have had deep shame. And, and their highest priority as the Jewish people is the family. Now think about it. A eunuch can't have a family. And so think about the shame that would have come. And one of the highest priorities for a Jewish person would be to pass on your name through your family. But a eunuch can't pass on their name. They can't have their family. And notice the specific healing that the Messiah offers here in verses 4 and 5 to those eunuchs. For thus says the Lord to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. Verse 5, I will give in my house, that's his temple, and within my walls a monument and a name. The place where they're hurting the deepest, that my name will never be passed on. Jesus says, I'm going to give you a name. Better than sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name. Thou shalt not be cut off. I wish I had time because here we're starting to develop a, a holy theology of singleness, actually, is what we're doing here. You commit yourself to the Lord. He's going to take care of your name. Whatever your specific hurting is and your specific wounding, just like to the eunuchs here, Jesus is going to speak to you specific healing for your specific brokenness and your specific shame. Come, Lord Jesus. All right. Now, verses, uh, in verse 9 here, before we dig in, here's what it meant to the original Jewish audience. Israel's leaders usually loved their kingdoms more than God's kingdom. So we look at the history of Israel in the Old Testament. They occasionally would have good kings and good leaders. But most of the time, their leaders, well, they didn't say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. They said, my kingdom come, my will be done. They were meant to shepherd God's people into following God's voice, and usually they didn't because they didn't listen themselves. Israel's leaders usually loved other, their own kingdoms more than God's kingdoms, and that's who God speaks to in verse 9. All you beasts of the field, come to devour all you beasts in the forest. God's calling to the foreign armies, by the way, to come and devour his people. Verse 10, his watchmen are blind. Watchmen is talking about the leadership, the spiritual leadership and the prophets. God calls them blind. His watchmen are blind. They're without knowledge. They're all silent dogs that cannot bark. Now think about what good is a watchdog that can't bark. That's what he's saying the leadership is. They're dreaming, they're lying down, they love to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite, they never have enough, but they're shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way. Now think about that. We just read in Isaiah 53 and verse 6 that all we like sheep have gone astray. What happens when the shepherds go their own way as well? Oof. Each to his own way, one and all. Come, they say, let us get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. It could be translated, we're going to drink even more tomorrow, or tomorrow will be even better. And yet, verse 1, the righteous man perishes, and no one lays it to heart. The, the leadership doesn't even care that this godly generation is passing away. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity, he enters into his peace, they die. These righteous people got old and they died. They rested in their beds who walk in their uprightness. And yet the godly leaders didn't care enough to disciple anybody, to pass it on. This is, this is awful. So, as we learn every four years, as we learn every four years in America, we really want good leadership. <laughs> in fact, if you listen really closely, a lot of people are crying out for a Messiah every four years and we're convinced that who we vote for is the Messiah. We're convinced of that. Oh, don't look at me that way, guys. Come on. Don't look at me that way. Now, by the way, we should pray for our leaders and we should vote, but ultimately our hope is not found in just a human. We need a good shepherd to come. 
God's people need a good shepherd who will lay down his life for the sheep. John chapter 10, love this painting. It's called The Good Shepherd. Look closely, you can see it's, it's Jesus stretched out on the cross. And in the background, it's sheep, if you look really closely. I love it. God's people need a good shepherd who will lay down his life for the sheep. So as you look for godly under shepherds, when you look for... Um, when you look for elders and when you look for pastors, you need to be looking for people who listen to the great shepherd's voice, the chief shepherd's voice. If they're not listening to the chief shepherd's voice, they're not going to shepherd you very well. If they're not feeding you God's word and showing you his voice through his word, they're not going to shepherd you very well. God's, he sent the chief shepherd, and now our job is to listen to his voice over and over and over again. The good shepherd who's, who laid down his life for the sheep. All right, Isaiah 57, verse 3. Here's what it meant to the original audience. You haven't read it yet, but here's what it means. All people are guilty of spiritual adultery. All people are guilty of spiritual adultery. The point that God's about to make. We love other things more than God. He's going to use very strong sexual adultery language in these verses. And he's going to say all of us are guilty of spiritually this adultery. Whenever you love something more than God, and we all do, it's adultery because you were created, you're created for him to be in intimacy with him, yet you don't want intimacy and you don't want dependence. All of us are guilty of spiritual adultery. So where did you get that? Verse three. But you, he's talking to the Israelites, draw near, sons of sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the loose woman, pause. But I'm a child of Abraham and Sarah. And God's like, if you don't trust in me, you're the son of a sorceress, the offspring of an adulterer and a loose woman. Don't trust in your lineage. Trust in me. Verse 4, whom are you mocking? Against whom do you open your mouth wide and stick out your tongue? Are you not the children of transgression, the offspring of deceit? You who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree? All right, this needs to be explained as well. So one of the ways that you would try and manipulate the world to get what you want is you would find the idol who would give you what you want. And what do we want? Well, we want fertility for our crops. We want fertility for our children or for our bodies. So one of the ways, in fact, it was the most common way to worship uh, the foreign gods around Israel was to go up on a high hill underneath some type of pole or tree and you would make love to your spouse or you'd make love to even more often a prostitute of the opposite sex. That's what he's saying right here. You who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree and then who slaughter your children in the valleys under the clefts of rocks. So sometimes, and this is very common in the, in the nations around them, they would literally, well, I, to get what I want, I'm gonna sacrifice my children literally to the fire, this, this awful God called Molech. Uh -uh. And we still sacrifice our children today to get what we want, don't we, brothers and sisters? Don't we? We're not any less guilty or more guilty than them. We all need a savior. Keep going, verse six. Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. They, these stones, they're your lot. To them you've poured out a drink offering, you've brought a grain offering. Shall I relent for these things? Now notice this language again. On a high and lofty mountain you have set up your bed. And there you went up to offer sacrifice. Behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your memorial. For deserting me, you have uncovered your bed. You've gone up to it. You have made it wide. In other words, you're inviting many lovers. And you have made a covenant for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on nakedness. You journeyed to the king with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You sent your envoys far off and you sent down even to Sheol. You were wearied with the length of your way, but you did not say it's hopeless. You found new life for your strength and so you were not faint. All of us, all of us are guilty of this spiritual adultery. All of us love other things more than God. So how does this point to Christmas? Well, all of our sin is a hunger for a better lover. I realize it's a little provocative, but you need to read the Old Testament. It's quite provocative. And not only that, Paul seems to agree because he says in Ephesians chapter 5 that husbands should love their wives as Christ loves the church. And it's not a chaste love. And so it's not a platonic, oh, hi, I love you. No, no, it's passionate. He passionately pursues you. 
All of our sin is a hunger for a better lover. And Jesus offers us forgiveness, intimacy, security, and joy beyond what the world can give. See, we all have to move from drug to drug because the old drug fails us. We've got to find a better drug. We all have to move from job to job because the old job failed us. We need a better job. We all have to move if we're not careful from spouse to spouse because the old spouse failed us. I need a better spouse, right? It's sin. We're hungry for a better lover and he's come. Jesus offers us forgiveness. He offers us intimacy that your heart's hungry for and security and joy. Joy beyond what the world can give. This is pointing to uh, a need for him. Now, this idolatry language is continued in verse 11. And to the original audience, all people are guilty of idolatry, controlling and manipulating life to get what we want. All people are guilty of idolatry, controlling and manipulating life to get what we want. And you're like, Tice, I've never, I'm, I've never you know, bowed down to a piece of stone or a block of wood. Well, what's the reason you roll out of bed in the morning? That's a hard one. Whatever the reason is, if it's not dependent intimacy with God, it's idolatry. Idolatry. Now, to be clear, your pastor is an idolater who repents regularly. Okay? Because, I mean, there are a lot of times, even this week, where I wake up and I know, Lord, you're calling me to dependent intimacy and I don't want it. That's actually a good place to say that out loud to God or in your heart. Lord, I don't want dependent intimacy with you today. I don't. Cleanse me. Change me. I repent. See, all pe- people are guilty of, spirit, of, of idolatry. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the life that we want, control life. That's what idolatry was. It's trying to control life, control the gods. You don't need intimacy with the gods. You get to go do, you learn the magic trick and they get you what you want. We're trying to get what we want. So he speaks to these idolaters in verse 11. Whom did you dread and fear? That speaks to 2020, right? When you trust in idolatry, what comes according to verse 11? Whom did you dread and fear? so that you lied and did not remember me, did not lay it to heart. Have I not held my peace even for a long time and you do not fear me? And it's like God said, just because I didn't slap you upside the head last week doesn't mean I'm silent. Verse 12, I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. He says, I'm gonna make your deeds known to everybody, your sin. Verse 13, and when you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. When, you. when things get hard, God says, go ahead and cry out to your idols. Let's see if they deliver you. The winds will carry them off. A breath will take them away. So, this explains why the world's gone nuts. Our idols have failed us. We're trying to find some new idols, including a vaccine that will help us to pursue those idols. Right? Right? We're putting our hope because we want to go back to normal to pursue our agenda, and God's saying, try and come back to me. All people are guilty of this. Now look at the, the end of verse 13. But, but, it doesn't have to be that way. Cry out to your idols, they won't save you. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land, and he shall inherit my holy mountain. I've been thinking about that holy mountain language. It's Zion. It's the place of intimacy where you meet with God personally. It's offered to everyone who takes refuge in the Messiah. We can entrust control of our lives to the Messiah. The reason people chase idols is because we want control to follow our paths. But you can entrust control of your lives to the Messiah. He promises to still our hearts by, sending, by leading us and walking with us on paths of intimacy for his glory. It's a mouthful, but it's so good. We can entrust control of our lives to the Messiah. We don't want, see, we want a God who mostly leaves us alone as long as we're nice. But that's still following, it's still idolatry and following your paths. Can you entrust your entire life, your entire marriage, all of your children and all your money and all your time to the living God and to Jesus the Messiah? Can you trust him? Can you? Oof. <laughs> that's a good idolatry exposing question right there. Because there's areas of my heart in which I say no, but those are the things I love more than him. But I, I, I give them to him over and over again, over and over again. And then he stills my heart and he leads me and he walks. doesn't just lead me like because he stands up there 30 yards ahead of me. He walks with me on paths of intimacy for his glory. Love that. 
Okay, now verses 14, uh, these directly point to the Messiah. So let's look at verses 14 and 15. Because it's a prophecy of the future. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. Remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Now, first of all, the Messiah is going to remove all these obstacles. It says uh, he's going to remove every obstruction from my people's way. The Messiah will clear the way to dependent intimacy with God. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. No one comes to intimacy with the Father except through, he clears all the obstacles, the sin obstacles, our hard heart obstacles. The Messiah is going to do that. Now look at verse 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. That word contrite, um, it means to be broken by your sin. So the holy God, what does he long for? He doesn't long for a bunch of self-righteous, proud people. He longs for people who are broken by their sin. The Bible has a word for that. It's called repentance. I love this painting. It's called Such is the Kingdom. Jesus said, such is the kingdom of God. Let the little children come to me. And we have the little child running, running, and there's Jesus going to embrace. I love that. That's repentance. The proper response to the Messiah is a life of continual repentance, a life of continual repentance. Now, some of you have baggage from that word repentance. I don't know. You think that that means the rest of your life you have to smack yourself with a whip or you have to do some type of penance, okay? That's not repentance. The word repentance simply means to turn. Turn from the things you love more than Christ to dependent intimacy with Christ. Turn from the things you love more than Christ to dependent intimacy with Christ. I mentioned this last week, but sometimes um, when you have an addiction, there's a temptation There's a temptation and you know you should turn. So you turn from the addiction to a slightly more socially acceptable addiction. But that's not biblical repentance. Biblical repentance is to turn from whatever, and all of us have sins and addictions, all of us have things we love more than him, to biblically repent is to run to Jesus. Run to Jesus over and over and over again. So this week, This week when I woke up and I recognized I don't want dependent intimacy with him, I I confess that is sin. That's repentance. That's the path of health. Then I trade my restless heart for his peace and his joy. Speaking of peace, we're going to jump to the end of the passage here because this gives us the problem. And then we'll look at the solution in the middle verses in just a moment. So jump down to verse 20. Verse 20. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, For it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So, our hearts are tossing and restless without Christ, lacking peace. There's a picture of this restless ocean. Our hearts are tossing and restless without Christ, looking for peace. Well, that didn't satisfy me. Maybe I'll turn to something else. Oh, maybe this will satisfy me. It's like we all have midlife crises every three years, right? To find a new idol that will fill up our hearts because we're restless like the ocean. Like the ocean. Okay, now there's something in this picture you maybe didn't see. There's a little boat up here. This picture's called the stilling of the storm. Do you see it? There's a little boat. And now, of course, the mast looks like a cross because masts actually do like cross. But that's great symbolism. And there's a little figure right here. And he's speaking peace, be still to the storm. That's what he says in verse 16. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit would grow faint before me in the breath of life that I made because of the iniquity of his unjust gain. I was angry. I struck him and I hid my face and I was angry. But he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. See this restless heart problem? Verse 18, I have seen his ways, but God says, I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips, peace, 
Peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. The Messiah has come. He offers peace to those who are far and those who are near. The Messiah has come and he offers peace to those who are far and those who are near. The Apostle Paul quotes this verse in Ephesians chapter 2. He says that God is putting together a people, the church, who proclaim, who experiences peace and then proclaim his peace. He quotes it. He says that Jesus offers those to peace to those who are near and those who are far away, Jews, the near, and Gentiles, the far away. He offers us peace. So what's our response? What's our response? Here it is. We sang it earlier. We're going to sing it again right now. Come to him with half your heart. Oh, that's not what it says. Sorry. Justine, if you're awake. Come to him with all your heart. Come and lay your burdens down. For peace he came to give, and joy shall be the crown. So I'm going to ask the music team to come up here, and we're going to sing this in closing. And respond to the Lord. He wants to do surgery on you, even as we sing or as you listen. Pray to him. Let me pray. Lord, we're bad surrenderers. We don't think that's the point of life. We think the point of life is to be nice while you stay a long ways away. We're bad surrenders. We don't desire intimacy with you, Lord God. Help us to taste and see of your goodness, even as we sing now, to come to you with all our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.